McCall, it is great to see you and to be back again. Oh, it is great to see you back at work. I know that you were enjoying your three-month maternity leave, but we certainly are happy to see you back in the studio and uh, bringing the Daytonians the weather once again. <laughs> thank you very much. Well, thank you everybody for joining us for Cloudy with a, a Chance of Podcast. As McCall mentioned, I am back from maternity leave and uh, happy to be back. Obviously sad to leave uh, my little girl, but the one perk of working in the middle of the night is that I am usually off work pretty early in the day. So I can be with her for most of her uh, afternoon and, and put her to bed and all that. So I do feel lucky because McCall, you're the opposite schedule of me. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Uh, I go to bed probably around 1 a.m. and Gia's up at 6.30, 7 a.m. and is ready to go. So <laughs> whether you are well, or we, not. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> we figured because of, uh, you know, kids are on our mind, we thought we would bring a pediatrician on. Obviously, we talk a lot about weather, but Weather impacts kids and scientists are always welcome of all different types. And so today we have Dr. Greg Eberhardt, who is with us from Cornerstone Pediatrics in Springboro. So uh, Dr. Eberhardt, welcome to the podcast. We're happy to have you. Yeah, thanks for having me. I think I was telling my staff, I think if I wasn't a pediatrician in my other life, I think I'd be a weather person. So I am a bit envious of you guys. I'm kind of a weather geek myself. So so we found kindred spirits here. So my wife would tell you the same, checking the weather That's channel constantly. <laughs> so it's pretty cool for me to chat with you guys too. Fantastic. I think that there's a lot of people at heart are, are meteorologists. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so yeah. So give us a little background on yourself. How long have you been practicing here in the Miami Valley? Yeah. So uh, years ago, when I finished, I went to medical school at High State. And when I finished, I had a combined Air Force uh, civilian residency here at Dayton Children's. So I was at Wright Pad and at Dayton Children's to train. The Air Force sent me out to Tucson for a few years when I was active duty, which wasn't a bad assignment. And, uh, and then when I finished there in the late 90s, I came back to town. So we've been back in town for 23 years now. So so yeah, and this practice, I started from scratch. There was not a practice and we just started from scratch. So, so now here we are 23 years later. I feel like this past year probably has been a quite of a busy year for you um, with COVID and, you know, taking care of the little ones and uncertainty really in this time. Yeah, I mean, a different year than obviously any of us have ever trained or kind of could anticipate. And, uh, and so dealing with some things we've never had to deal with before, but uh but I think thankfully, and I think for most of the practices in town with some help from the government and things like that, I think we're coming through and I think we're all starting to see kind of the normalcy slowly return back. And, and, and I think thankfully for my staff's sake and my coworkers' sake, I think we've stayed kind of viable through all this. So, so it has been a stressful year, but we're getting there. And so. That's good. That's good to hear. I guess since we're kind of already talking about it, um, let's get into that for this past year for your practice. Um, you know, what has that been like in terms of making changes for treating children? Um, you know, obviously just regular wellness checkups are so important for kids, especially in their first several years of life. So you probably had wellness checks going on, but then sick kids and how did you decipher, or, you know, did you have to do any, any changes just in your day-to-day -day practice? Yeah. So, so early on, that was a critical thing for us and certainly for families, they were concerned. They did not want to bring their little newborn in an office with a five-year-old that's coughing and might have COVID. And so, so I think we pretty quickly after meeting and kind of discussing, you know, CDC guidelines, et cetera, um, split our office in half. So we had a sick side and a well side and we split our schedule in half. So in the mornings, we just saw well children. And so when the day before, when we were kind of reminding people, we screened to make sure that people weren't sick, having coughs or things like that. And so, so that has worked well, keeping his family safe, but it's been a bit challenging. We can be a little bit less flexible. If someone calls at eight in the morning because their child has an earache, like you, know, you get to wait till the afternoon because we're only seeing sick kids. And so, so it has been a little bit of a challenge, but I think from a ultimately the staff adjusted pretty quick. And from a safety perspective, obviously it makes families feel a lot safer if they're bringing their little one in that there's no sick kids around and it gives us still the freedom in the afternoon to still see a lot of sick kids. And so that's, 
been a big change, but it's been a good change, I think so. Yeah. Have you found any like confusion with families with multiple kids, you know, because like you said, it's not, you have your sick and your, your well kids. Sometimes you have one of each. And yeah. in that situation, what, how do you advise the parent in that situation? Yes. I mean, we've had kids, you know, you can't control this. Obviously you okay. schedule your well child appointment. And then, you know, the day before, of course, they always start having a runny nose or a fever or a cough or things like that. So again, physically we've, we tried to screen ahead of time. If, if they were sick, we'd try to try to reschedule them. But, but now that things are kind of opening back up, I mean, we, again, would kind of just shuffle those people to the sick side. So they're not kind of waiting and right next door to a little newborn baby or things like that. Um, and I think families are pretty accepting of it overall. I think it hasn't been a, a, a big push to kind of make people do these things. I think people get it and, and are respectful and glad that we're kind of screening and watching for those things. So I don't think it's been a huge push on either side. I think once we figured it out and once they figured out what we were doing, it's been relatively easy. I feel that um, as I'm not a new mom, but I remember what it was like four years ago and having your first child, how scary it can be anytime your baby is coughing or sneezing and then to put on top of that a, a pandemic um how do you work with the parent to make sure that they're not freaking out when it's not necessary to freak out i i, I say this to my staff all the time and the students that work with us things i think a pediatrician's job a lot of times is just to hold hands and kind of make <laughs> sure that everybody's okay and i mean i think uh, and you both can attest to this. I mean, and I, I think in the rest of your life, there will be nothing better you do than your children. I mean, I think they're the most prized thing you ever do. And so you care a lot about them and love them a lot. And you don't want to take any chances. And, and obviously, this has added a whole nother layer to this um, that's made it a little more complicated. Um, but I think on multiple levels, there's the physical part of you know not getting sick from somebody who's in the room next to you. But I think the mental health part of this has been a constant struggle for families both of school age kids and younger kids. I saw a family, I don't know, a few months ago that had a little nine month old who literally had never seen uh, another human being since they were in the hospital. Like the family lived out on a farm, they just stayed home. And I think the first time she went out, like the parents met the grandparents at a Target or something, she just looked around as if she had landed on Mars or something. Like she didn't realize human beings existed somewhere else. I mean, these are, they sound like strange concepts, but but I think it's the reality that some of these babies who were born you know, 14, 15 months ago have kind of lived in isolation. And so, so I think that's been another piece of this that families are, continue to struggle with and, and I think are happy that kind of the world is starting to open back up and kids can be a little more normal now. And if you can give us these nice weather days and get these kids outside, that's a big help too. So. Yeah, but these yeah. nice weather days also translate into high pollen count. Well, that's true, that's true. <laughs> Yeah, so let's uh, talk about that because we talk about a lot with adults of like, I, I know just in the newsroom, we've done like so many infographics of like, is it COVID? Is it allergies? Is it a cold? Well, for kids and my daughter is back in daycare now. I mean, she's had a persistent runny nose. I mean, for a while, we took her yeah. in once and we did a COVID test and she is almost two. So she did not like that. Um, yeah. But, you know, it, it was a good, it, it was better safe than sorry. Since yeah. she was in daycare, our pediatrician was like, we're just going to make sure. Mm -hmm. um, but I would love to know uh, for parents, you know, what do you do now? We have tree pollen counts that are so high right now, this time of year for the little ones. How can you even tell? when your kid is pretty young, if it could even be pollen, that's maybe keeping runny eyes and, and sneezing and that kind of thing around for them. Yeah, it, it is a hard thing. I think in general, if you talk just kind of ballpark kind of things, I think with real little ones, infants uh, under one or even kind of one to two year olds, the likelihood of pollen allergy, grass allergy, mold allergy is a bit lower. I think as you get older and get exposed to these things in the world, that that likelihood rises more. And certainly if both your parents are real allergic and if you live in the Miami Valley where <laughs> pollens tend to kind of congregate, it's not a good combination here too. Um, but you're right, there's a lot of overlap. If we talk about just about, you know, some post nasal drip and coughing and drainage and congestion, all that kind of stuff, that could be COVID. So the other pieces of it sometimes give us a clue. It's certainly just red, itchy, watery eyes that would tend to be more allergy, not COVID. Um, rashes, eczema, things like that would tend to be more allergies, not COVID. And certainly fevers and kind of body aches and things like that would be more likely COVID. But 
but a lot of the rest of the symptoms certainly could be both. And, and one of the dilemmas is that a lot of the kids who have had COVID at least have not been that sick. I think some of the perception of the public is if you have COVID, you know, you're struggling to breathe and you're on high fevers and you're in the hospital. And the reality for most kids that who have it is it's you know, not that different than a cold. And so, so even before COVID, I struggled sometimes, as you talked about your child in daycare, like this time of year, it's sometimes hard to sort them out. So some families, we just have them, you know, if, if you have a strong history of allergies and you notice, well, when we go outside, it seems to get worse, try some allergy medicine, some antihistamines, a Benadryl, a Zyrtec, things like that. And if it makes a big difference, obviously you can just kind of keep rolling with it. So. Is there an age, I guess, that kids start to, you know, obviously, like you said, the little ones, like two, you know, two and below, not really, but like Gia's four, right, McCall? Mm -hmm. So like, yeah. at what age do children start to maybe deal with seasonal allergies that parents could be kind of on the lookout for? And I, I'm interested at your answer because I feel like in years past, Gia hasn't shown a lot of signs of allergies, but for the past few weeks, it's like she's stuffed up all the time. And I wonder if she's just starting to develop an allergy to maybe tree pollen. Yeah. So I think that age, as kids are kind of moving about in the world, you know, so most kids don't start walking until about after a year. And then that next year, you kind of get out in the world and move around. And then the more time you spend out in the world outside getting exposed to things, the more your immune system can kind of start reacting to those things. So certainly that one to two year is kind of a transitional period. And then probably any time after two, kids absolutely could have allergies. And I think families who have kids with allergies see this, that they cut the grass and they notice a problem or they pet grandma's yeah. cat and they sneeze and cough and things like that. And so, so the families just need to watch if they notice specific circumstances that seem to set it off. Um, and, and then ultimately you can talk to your physician if there's, you know, medicines aren't working. We sometimes can test for allergy to see if there's some things we can eliminate and isolate. The dilemma with most allergies, though, I joke with parents is that, I mean, when we talk about grass and tree pollen and mold, you know, short of moving to Arizona, there isn't that much to do. I mean, I think unless you lock yourself in the basement, I think those things are around. And so, so you can try to control things, keep windows closed and things like that. But if you're living in this world, you're going to be out in some of those things. So Pretty much my daughter at four in everything, long hair, getting pollen <laughs> yeah. and sleeping with it. I don't have to worry about that as much. So yeah. <laughs> well, it's not just the pollen that kids have to worry about this time of year. It's our UV index is getting really high. And I know it's so hard to get my daughter to make sure that she has sunblock everywhere. And she's just gone back to school about a few weeks ago. And I've noticed she's getting really red, like under here as if she's not getting enough sunblock here. Um, so any tips for someone like me? <laughs> yeah. yeah. Other than like waiting till they're sound asleep and sneaking it on them or something. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I think, uh, and all of us who have had toddlers know they have opinions about all these things and they know mm -hmm. more than you do. Um, and so it can be difficult, but, but again, I think for those of us uh, who can have sun issues uh, and you're going to be spending significant times outside. I mean, if you can do uh, mitigation things, you know, under an umbrella, if you're going for a stroller, that the stroller kind of uh, top is over them. If you're going to be at the pool, you can sit under the umbrella. But if your kids going to be running around, exposed areas, just you need to use sunscreen on them. And it's just not negotiable. I mean, I, there's some things when I talk with kids like seat belts, uh, car seats, brushing your teeth, like those things are not negotiable. And as a parent, you just have to say, this is not like, there's something you want to wear your purple socks with your red and orange striped shoes. Fine. Whatever I think, but, but brushing teeth, sunscreen, those kinds of things, these are not negotiable items. You just have to do it. And, and there's certainly, we all know we have some kids that are very cooperative and some kids who are looking to pick a fight. And I think you just have to kind of Hold I think my daughter too. leans more towards the drama queen. <laughs> I literally put a little bit of something black here and she's like, my eyes. You're killing me. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Like, it didn't even go anywhere near your eye. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. And you know what? I didn't even think about really, but I should now that I have, you know, Mar my daughter, Margo, she's about to be two. So she runs around, she's outside. Um, putting sunscreen on before school. I mean, it's part of my beauty routine. I always have like a facial moisturizer that has sunscreen, 
but it's not just the pool or like a planned walk. Really, if they're going to be in daycare or at school, they're out midday usually is when they'll do some form of recess. And that is direct UV solar. You know, it's April. You get a sunburn. The UV index is a seven today. So um, yeah, I didn't even think about that really. Yeah. <laughs> but I mean, you the, just got, it's just got to be part of your routine. Like go you in said, in the like morning. tooth brushing or other, those things are. Yep. Absolutely. One thing that I have also noticed with uh, Gia, and I don't know if this is something that you've seen, Dr. Eberhardt, with um, my daughter's hands getting extremely dry and chapped. And my mom mentioned to me that maybe it's just because there's a lot of hand washing and maybe a lot of hand sanitizer. And so I'm, I'm finding myself needing to moisturize her hands more. Is, is that something that you've noticed that uh, has popped up in the past year? Yeah, I mean, just interestingly, this morning, I just saw a little almost two year old and mom was very frustrated and she's a daycare kid and I'm, and she wasn't certain, but we assume that they use hand sanitizer a fair amount. I mean, those alcohol based hand sanitizers are good at killing germs, but they boy, they dry and suck the oil out of your skin. And so, and if you're already a person who's a bit sensitive, has allergies or sensitive skin, we're kind of doubling down. Um, and so it's a never ending fight. So in the winter months, it's really dry. Your skin gets dry and it's bothersome. And then the spring hits and allergies hit, and then that irritates your skin. And so, so I think for families who have some of that predilection for parents and for kids, I think a big part of it is just eliminating as much risk as you can. So if you know you're sensitive to pollens and things, you've been playing outside, when you come inside, try to get those clothes off and get into clean clothes. If, if you're doing laundry and washing bath time, things like that, try to eliminate perfumes and dyes and artificial colors and things like that. The more we can kind of stay with natural, no dyes, no perfumes, things like that. I think people with sensitive skin do a bit better. And then ultimately, if your skin is getting that dry, just super, super aggressive, moisturizing. And there are cases where it can be eczema, if you've heard of that, where it can be pretty pronounced. And in those circumstances, there might be some prescription medicines, even your pediatrician might prescribe. But, uh, but I think as much as you can eliminate things can help being super aggressive with moisturizers can help. But if it's, that's not working, then you can talk to your doctor about some prescription things. And I wrote her a prescription for something this morning. So speaking oh, yes. of skincare and things like that, as we get into the summer months and you always hear this, but let's just run through it again, as far as sunscreen for kids is 30 SPF good and how frequently should we be reapplying especially if the kids are going in and out of the pool and things like that yeah so and I think you can get online and read multiple different things or read mm -hmm. manufacturers recommendations they're going to say different things I mean, and I think and they make you know SPF from I don't know five up to you know a hundred or something now so uh, yeah <laughs> so do they really it's just a lead shield no, I, I think <laughs> you put in front yeah. Of you. yeah so yeah um but <laughs> But I think uh, certainly uh, for activities where you're going to be getting wet at the pool or things like that, or sporting activities are going to be real sweaty. And you mentioned your daughter, I'm sure she's playing and she gets sweaty and yeah, rubs yeah. her eyes. And so sunscreen and things like that get wiped off. And so, you know, if you're going to be at the pool, you're going to be at a soccer game, whatever, you just got to watch that. And if you see them sweaty, I mean, you just got to reapply it pretty frequently. It might be every hour or two if they're super active at things. Um, and I think certainly if you're in a family where sun protection is more important, your skin is fair and you know, your kids are going to burn, you just gotta, you gotta stay on it. And so, so, and I think most experts recommend at least SPF 30. I think knowing your kids, it, I mean, they make 45s and fifties and sixties. I think any of those are fine, but probably at least SPF 30 is going to be good. So. What about, you know, today's 82, so it's not horrible, but it is pretty hot. As we're getting into the summertime, your kids want to be super active. Um, you know, what about hydration or watching for signs of dehydration in the little ones? And can you kind of break it down for age groups? Because I know, you know, for obviously if they're you know, so little they're on formula only, but once they start mixing the water in, then, um, you know, what should you be looking for, for like, let's say a, a smaller toddler to like a young kid who's like six, seven, eight, um, yeah. in terms of signs of dehydration. And then what can you give them? Yeah. So with the real little ones, toddlers, uh, preschoolers that aren't potty trained yet, I mean, checking diapers is a, an easy way to kind of assess, are they peeing frequently enough? I think one of the best ways, even for older kids up to school age that I tell parents is a super simple way to check for hydration uh, is just to look and feel inside their mouth. Kids that are starting to get dehydrated, normally your tongue and your gums should be pretty moist and kids that are starting to get that way, it's starting to get tacky, kind of sticky. And that's a real simple little 
and moms can do this, put their finger in their kid's mouth and kind of see if it's kind of dry or wet. Um, so that's a pretty simple rule. Um, I think for the little ones, if you're going to be outside and on particularly hot days, just gosh, hydration, hydration, hydration. And, and that holds true even through high school. It's interesting. I have this conversation, maybe one of my pet peeves, and I'm not going to throw any particular supermarket under the bus here, but I think you can go to a supermarket here in town and there's an entire aisle of what I consider just worthless drinks for kids from sport drinks to juices to, and I'm not mentioning any brands. Um, so even except for at the most elite of levels, there's very little evidence that these sports hydration drinks make that much of a difference for a child who eats a good diet, gets proteins, gets fats, gets carbs, um, has some salt in their diet and drinks water, um, except for the very extremes of you know, temperatures or elite level performance. Um, there's really not much of a need for all these kind of fancy sports drinks and heck water is a heck of a lot cheaper. Um, I think kids love these sweetened drinks and they get almost addicted to them. And, uh, and I think from a family perspective, I talked to parents about this from early on, like sweetened drinks should be treats, not kind of a routine for kids. And so I think just water, 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 uh, and just consistent meals. And if you're going to be an activity that's pretty exertional, some snacks during that time, just to keep your sugar up too. So, so I think most of the same principles, again, in babies, we can check diapers and things like that, but if we talk about older kids getting dehydrated, I think look at performance. If, if we're talking about activities, I think kids that are starting to lag behind in soccer that normally are kind of leading the pack, kind of running out of gas. I think if you see those I'm going to start, ugh, circumstances, kind of check that out. And certainly in some kids, they can start getting very flushed. If your body's getting too hot, they may look real red and things like that. So, and I think for most parents who watch their kids, they get a sense of like, boy, they're just not performing like I expect them to, and just kind of be aware of that. So. I think there is definitely that balance and knowing as a parent, because, you know, speaking um, of my daughter, her face will get all flush and I have to know that that's a sign because she doesn't necessarily want to stop, you know, yeah. okay, <laughs> it's break time. How about we do an ice pop or something, you know, let's yep. just take a moment um, yep. and just being aware of that for yep. sure. And, and when they're having fun, I just like all of us, I think when you're having fun, you don't want to stop. And so, and I think even less so they don't have that self-awareness. And so, and most of these events, there's plenty of parents watching these things that can kind of keep an eye out for your kid and their own mm -hmm. kids. So I have a personal question and I hope that you yeah. can answer this. Okay. Um, so I am able to uh, give my child breast milk, my daughter. I feel really lucky. I know this isn't for everybody and fed is best, obviously. But um, I don't think that many people kind of understand the one of the benefits of giving breast milk is that natural immunity that you could give for really little ones before they build it themselves. So are you able to kind of explain that? And obviously with like cold and flu season, it's helpful. And then also with COVID, it can be beneficial as well when it comes to any antibodies the mother has can be passed on. But you're obviously the professional. So I would love to hear it from someone who actually knows way more than what I could imagine. No, and I think as you kind of alluded to, I think as much as I'm a big proponent of breastfeeding, and I think it's a spectacular thing you can do for your kid, I, I similarly have to be aware that, I mean, every mom's got to do kind of what works for them. And, and, and yeah. uh, I have this conversation with new moms frequently that your confidence and competence and comfort taking care of your infant is infinitely more important than whether they get breast milk or formula. Um, if you can breastfeed, that's fantastic. Um, but if you cannot, formula is the best it's ever been. I, I joke, that, and my mom would tell you this, I was raised on formula. I turned out reasonably okay. We're not giving so your baby, <laughs> you're not giving your baby poison if they can't breastfeed. Um, but, but if we talk about if you can breastfeed and it goes well, when I talk to moms, I think there's really three, to me, the three key good things about breastfeeding. One is um, just the nutritional part of it. I mean, it's, it's how you could argue how we were designed. I mean, it has the proteins, the fats, the carbohydrates, the electrolytes, everything that babies need to grow, how human beings were designed. Um, and then there's the immunologic part of this that you uh, alluded to. So Infants, when they come out into this world, have an immune system, but it's just not that competent yet. It never has had to do anything and hasn't been exposed to anything. It's part of why newborns get 
so many shots in that first year is, I mean, there's kind of these competing curves of baby's immune system that's really low and needs time to kind of build up immunity. Um, but if you wait till then, they have this gap. And so if we give it early, they have more immunity in the short term. So certainly a mom who can breastfeed in those first six to 12 months when their baby's immune system is a little weaker just adds uh, some extra boost to that. You alluded to there's some good studies in the last few months that have shown moms who've either been vaccinated with COVID or have had COVID passively pass those COVID antibodies to their babies. And so that's a really good thing in the world we are in right now. And so so I think that's the second part. And then the third part, I mean, may seem obvious to you, but it's kind of the social emotional part of it. And as a male who's never breastfed, I can't speak to this, but I mean, there's something about physically attaching your baby to you and experiencing that, um, that is very positive thing for moms and for babies. And so, so I think those three parts, nutritionally, immunologically, and then social emotionally, I think in all those areas, that's a good thing. Um, but again, if you're from fed, you can hold your baby and that's cool, emotional, oh, social yeah. thing. Uh, again, I, I don't want to in any way uh, be perceived as kind of bashing moms who were formerly fed because I'd be bashing my own mother if I did that. And so <laughs> I was going to say, I mean, as a mom, I am very much um but both my children get formula and whatever I can give, I can give that too. But yeah, I mean, whatever feeds your baby is the best way by far. And you, you mentioned it, but your mental well being is also extremely important as a new mom. And really with any kid, you could have multiple children, as long as you both are working together to make sure that your baby is fed and that you're also in a good place. Um, we're very lucky that that formula is as wonderful as it is. So, but it is just interesting though, like you said, some of those studies, um, I don't know. It's crazy. (laughs) Well, there's always been a lot of talk about breast milk and, you know, all of the benefits of having it and, and passing it along to your children. So it doesn't surprise me that we're seeing more and more studies of how COVID or someone who's had a vaccine or maybe had it at one point passing the antibodies along, how that could be beneficial. But I think that you did a great job. You know, you didn't keep out the moms that can't uh, breastfeed. I, I mean, I, I didn't have the, the ability to do so. And I will say that my pediatrician at the time and my OB was like, you just have to let it go. You know what I mean? It was more right. of a battle for me to be able to let that go. Um, and Gia is driving me crazy. <laughs> So she's yeah. just great, you she know, feisty and smart and everything. But yeah, yeah. exactly. So, yeah. She gets that from her um, father. So yeah. yes, yeah. 100% her Italian so, father yeah. is yeah. where she gets it from. Yeah, <laughs> probably. <laughs> well, I just, one more question, COVID related. Um, obviously we talk a lot about uh, the adults with the different vaccines that are out. If people choose to get them. Do you, as a pediatrician, have any update, I guess, for any kids or teenage years? I know like that that was kind of on the, ver- I'm not fully updated even with like what's going on with teens and or younger children. So do you have any update for anybody who's listening um, that might be wondering about younger kids with that option for a vaccine? Yeah. What have you been doing the last three months? No, yeah. Uh, <laughs> right? No, I, mean, I try, but I didn't want to say something and, and be yeah. like wrong. So yeah. you. <laughs> Um, so a couple of things, I mean, personally, I mean, interestingly, we're doing this today and our first shipment of COVID vaccine from the state arrived in our office at 11 this morning. So just like two hours Whoa. ago. So yeah, so it's kind of cool. So, so we had early on signed up to be a distributor of the vaccine, but obviously the, both at the federal level and the state level, they were kind of distributing it to high volume health departments and, you know, CVSs and things like that. But now there's enough supply that we can. So we have, several clinics come up in the next few, this next week where we're going to be immunizing. Now, obviously the only age group that is uh, licensed to get a vaccine right now is 16 to 18 year olds. And so, so that's who we're going to be doing. Um, but I think in the next few weeks, potentially the 11 to 17 year old vaccine could be available. Uh, the American Academy of Pediatrics has uh, applied for emergency approval of a vaccine for 11 to 17 year olds. So stay tuned. I think it's potentially uh, optional that we may have a vaccine before the end of the school year for junior high and high school age kids. I still think we're probably six to 12 months away for 
from a vaccine for younger kids for you know elementary age five to ten year olds and maybe a bit longer for for the little ones six months to five year olds but those trials are going on right now both six month to five year olds and like five to ten year olds so so they're in the pipeline i think stay tuned i think there could be an announcement in the next few weeks about a vaccine for junior high and high school kids for the average parent that may be, you know, having questions down the line, um, where where would you say go to get that information? Yeah, I think there, you I mean, there's directly to your pediatrician, or is there like an online area? If you if you go to the CDC website, cdc.gov, and then there's a, a immunization kind of panel, and they have a lot of information there. It can be a little bit overwhelming having gone there. I think there's a ton of information there, and. So if you're not sure, certainly you can call your pediatrician's office. I think most offices have, <laughs> we've answered plenty of calls about this. Um, and I think bigger picture, I mean, I think when we talk about immunizations, I have to be careful kind of exactly how I word this, but I think certainly I'm a big proponent of COVID vaccine. I got it as soon as I could get it and I recommend that families do it. But from a statistical risk, I think it's a little harder sell for these little kids. When you look at national numbers, hospitalizations and deaths in kids, thankfully, have been very, very low. And so so I have families that ask me like, well, is my child really at that huge of a risk if they don't get vaccinated? And and I'd be lying to them if I said like, no, it's this massive, huge risk because the numbers just aren't there. And yet I think just from a, uh, and I don't want to get too deep philosophical perspective, um, and I think having spoken to my parents who, when they got a vaccine, just felt this massive weight, like, oh, I can finally live in the world again, that I think as a community, I think the more of us who do this and the more we can kind of move forward, it just lets everyone live kind of a normal life. And, and I think when family asks, well, why should I do it? I think it's, I think it's a safe vaccine and I think it works spectacularly well. It's a very effective vaccine. But I think more than anything, just as a community, if we all do this, it's just going to let us all get back to normal a lot quicker. And so... So I think uh, you need to ask questions. I, I think blind faith in me or in any entity is not a good, good thing. I think if you have questions, you need to get those clarified. And so if you do talk to your pediatrician, but but I think, uh, but from my opinion, I, we're starting to give these vaccines and I think when they come out, we will recommend them, so. And I think you did, uh, hit the nail on the head. It's an informed decision. Whatever decision you're going to make, make sure that it's informed. Absolutely. And uh, that decision is yours. And you know that you're doing it based on information you've acquired. Yep. And there's no bad questions. I mean, I think, uh, as I said earlier, I think your children are the single biggest thing you have in your life. And, and you want to make the best decision for them. And, and we should be here to support you in that and have that conversation, not to dictate it to you, but to help you make the best decision you can. Exactly. Wonderful. Thank you, Dr. Everhart. I think this is probably a great note to end on. Um, wonderful to hear from you. And you talked with us about all of the different topics yeah. we threw at you. <laughs> so cool. <laughs> so we, cool. Well, thank we really, you. <laughs> hopefully we'll talk to you again soon. Maybe we'll do an update down the road as, as things continue to progress. So um, we really appreciate it. And if people want to get in touch with you, or maybe they are searching out a pediatrician, how can they get in touch with you? So, I mean, they can call our office. Uh, and I think if you just Google Cornerstone Pediatrics in Dayton, it'll, it'll come up. And so, so yeah, just call our office. All right. Thank you so much for joining cool. us. Thank and you as guys. always, and as always, thank you for joining us with Cloudy with a Chance of Podcast. To listen to this podcast, you can download any podcast app that you have and search for Cloudy with a Chance of Podcast. Also on um, Apple Fire, uh, on our streaming app, WHIO TV, you can see the video version of this podcast. So as always, thank you so much for joining us. We'll see you next time. Thanks, guys.